Okay, I want to welcome all of you here this evening. I'm Jane Barris, the Vice President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and we're delighted to have you here at one of our favorite places. Um, we have a, a wonderful board member who is with the law firm of Dorsey and Whitney, and he very graciously started us on a relationship with the law firm several years ago, and it's always a treat to be here. So thank you to Dorsey and Whitney. Is, I'm sorry, is there anyone here from the law firm today who we can thank in person? No, well, in absentia, we thank them very much. So as many of you know, this uh, event this evening is part of the series that the National Committee has been doing in conjunction with the 50th anniversary. We were founded back in 1966, and this is now 2016, and so since January, we've been celebrating our anniversary in a variety of ways. One of them is our Leaders Speak series, which began last January with four former secretaries of state. We just last month had three, an all-female panel, which we're very proud of, of a former Secretary of Commerce and two former U.S. Trade Representatives talking about our trade and economic relations with China. And next Monday night in Washington, we are going to have the third in our Leaders Speak series that will have three former National Security Advisors speaking. So if any of you happen to be in Washington, we would be delighted to have you with us. Or if you have friends who are going to be in Washington, please have them contact us. And in fact, next Monday is going to be a very exciting day for the National Committee because not only are we having the third in our Leaders Speak series, but we're also having a 50th anniversary reunion. And this is for all of our former staff members, people who've been involved in our conferences, our exchanges, our activities over the years, and we're really looking forward to it. So if any of you in the room happen to be in Washington and would like to come, let us know. Or if you know people living in Washington who've been closely connected with the committee, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of old friends. Um, so those are two activities that are part of our 50th celebration, the Leaders Speak series and our reunion. But tonight we're here for another long-term program that also is part of our 50th celebration, and that's the China and the World series. We have up till now done I should have done my homework on this. I think four, five in that series. We've had Russia. We've had Africa. Africa. That's right. I was I was away in China for several of these, so that's why I don't know them all. But and India uh, in this very room. But tonight we are moving southward to Southeast Asia, and I'm really really pleased to be able to moderate this event because. One of the panelists is not only an old and dear friend, but also a former board member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. When I asked him what he wanted me to emphasize in his bio, he said, all you have to say is I was a former board member of the National Committee. So, <laughs> enough said. Um, I'm not going to take any more time talking about our speakers or uh, going into great detail in their bios, because you all have a version of that in front of you, and it's quite detailed. Uh, except to say that it is a terrific group of experts who know a lot about the region. The report that we all hope you have a copy of, and if you don't, you will pick it up on your way out. It's an excellent opportunity for anybody who wants to know about sort of the history of Southeast Asia, the security aspects of their interrelations with relationships with one another for this particular uh, event the aspects of China's involvement with Southeast Asia and sort of the U.S. engagement in the region as well and what implications that might, those might have for U.S.-China relations in currently and in the future. Um, I think we're going to have presentations, brief presentations from our panelists and then we will open it up to questions and um, really very, very pleased to, to have Bates with us and his colleagues. And I should also say that the program, the report itself was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, which is a wonderful foundation in Chicago that has sponsored a lot of really <coughs> terrific academic studies on China and its relationship with the world. So Bates, okay. it's all yours. I'll just say a few brief introductory remarks. First of all, thanking you very, very much, Jan, for taking the time to be with us. Everyone in this room knows uh, what a wonderful 
uh, individual personality and force of nature, uh, Jan has been uh, for this fantastic organization and will certainly be for many, many more years to come. Um, so I was really pleased, Lynn, that you were going to be able to join us tonight because I know you're usually on an airplane between here and, and China. Uh, thanks to the National Committee. Thanks to our hosts this evening as well. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be able to come here and present this study and a great coincidence and um, uh, I think fortuitous opportunity to uh, add to, to hopefully uh, bring even greater value to the many, many events that the committee is, is doing this year uh, in relation to this fabulous 50th anniversary year. So uh, today we want to talk about Southeast Asia and I think we'll try to give as much emphasis as we can to uh, the relationship between China and Southeast Asia, but uh, obviously being here in the United States, uh, all of us have an enormous interest uh, in that relationship uh, in Southeast Asia. And the purpose of this study, undertaken more than two years ago uh, at the beginning, was to examine the U.S. Uh, emerging security partnerships in the region, uh, with particular focus on three countries which uh, had had difficult histories with the United States in the past, namely Myanmar, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Uh, and to examine how all of those relationships, indeed all the relationships the United States has in Southeast Asia, were undergoing significant and interesting changes, in part, but not entirely, because of uh, China's emergence as a greater influence uh, in that region as well. So last, at the end of last year, we issued three country studies on Indonesia, on Myanmar, and on Vietnam. And what we have before us tonight is sort of the capstone report uh, of the project which is looking at the broader triangular strategic relationship amongst the United States, China, and Southeast Asia. I think it's fair to say that over the course of the, of the project, that the importance of understanding China's role in this part of the world became ever greater. Um, we, we, we weren't predicting it, obviously, but I think that the very issues that we are uh, focusing on here tonight have become more and more salient. Uh, to the future, more so than I think we may have predicted even only two or three years ago. Um, I think we make the argument that Southeast Asia is now at the center of the Indo-Pacific's dynamic strategic picture and is increasingly becoming a locus for strategic competition between the United States and China, for better or for worse. Um, so understanding the relationship amongst these three parties, and especially China's role in the region demands far greater U.S. attention and presents both opportunities and challenges uh, for strengthening American engagement in the wider Indo-Pacific. <laughs> so this study tries to tackle all those big issues and we do it in three major parts. The first tries to understand the Southeast Asian perspective uh, upon relations with the United States, upon relations with China, and how best to strike the right balance uh, for their own national interests in that increasingly difficult uh, strategic triangle which is emerging. Uh, secondly, in the report, we want to look at China's strategic rationale and its prospects in Southeast Asia and how the United States affects those calculations. And then lastly, we want to present findings and recommendations uh, basically for the new government uh, which will be entering um, power in the United States come this November uh, and try to argue strenuously that what we see as a pretty strong success story for the United States in Southeast Asia over the past five to ten years needs to be sustained. So in that first part, I want to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Evelyn Goh, uh, who authored the section in the report that looks at Southeast Asia's strategic outlook. Then we'll turn to uh, Dr. Chin Ha Huang, uh, who's going to be talking to us about China's perspectives on all these questions. And then I'll try to wrap up quickly uh, in delivering some of our ideas about what we think the United States should do going forward. So, you know, Dr. Goh. Dr. Goh, before you begin, I just should have said, even though you have their bios in front of you, some of you may not be familiar with the institutions which they represent. But you have people here from two of the top institutions in Southeast Asia, top institutions of higher education. Um, Dr. Huang is from Singapore, and uh, his institution is well known as sort of the mecca for people who are really thoughtful intellectuals who want to um, talk about and think about um, Southeast Asia from the perspective of Singapore. And ANU, 
uh, Australian National University has long been known among people in the China field as far and away the top university in Australia for China studies. It has a really historic and highly, highly respected China Center. And it's wonderful that Dr. Go and Dr. Gill are both there representing the new generation of scholars at ANU. Are we in the same generation? <laughs> <laughs> Some I knew, but new to ANU. Yeah, I Thank you. Shall I? Please. Good. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, we, we, we are at the long end of two years of work on this project, and, and please forgive any sort of inside jokes that you, know, you may <laughs> witness. It's been a long road. Um, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be at the, uh, you know, to be at an event organized by the US China National, Commi uh, National Committee on US China Relations. My first encounter with the committee was when, as a graduate student in Oxford. Um, I, my first book, and indeed my PhD thesis, was on Nixon's opening to China and the uh, preceding 15 years of policy, US policy making on China. Um, so I do remember looking through the files and at the contemporary reports of the work on the National Committee. So it's very exciting to be here. Um, now I'm here obviously to talk about a different subject, um, Southeast Asia and the Great Powers. Um, this would be the first, are you singling to me? No, okay, <laughs> someone's gesturing it back. Um, this would be the first section of the report that you've got. Um, and we thought it was important to have a section of the report that would essentially try to generalize across what is a d large, diverse, um, and uh, as must be obvious to anybody who reads the papers these days, very divided um, sub-region of the world. Um, as I like to tell my Southeast Asian counterparts, you know, we're not terribly important as a part of the world. Um, it would be better if we remained that way, unfortunately, in recent years. Um, regardless of Southeast Asian preferences, we appear to be strategically more important than, than we have been in the post-Cold War period, but such is life. Um, the section of the report on Southeast Asia is divided into three sections. Um, we look first at the strategic imperatives, key strategic imperatives that we might say are shared amongst these 10 nevertheless diverse countries and which indelibly shape their approaches to the great powers. And in this case, we're most concerned about the US and China, obviously. In the second section, I look at um, some trends that we can identify in changes in Southeast Asian policies or approaches towards balancing that relationship with the US and with China over the last decade or so. And in the final section, um, which is a short one, um, I try, try to sort of uh, summarize what we might see going forward given this situation. Now, there's a couple of things which are important for those of us starting by looking at Southeast Asia. It is, of course, you know, a post-colonial region, um, small and medium-sized states. Um, very much engaged still in the process of national consolidation. Um, so if we think about strategic imperatives for these small, medium-sized countries, um, we might think of three in particular, well, two in particular. Um, I would say that the core regional security principle of Southeast Asia would be the prevention of domination by a single power, or what is in regional parlance usually called the prevention, uh, prevention of intramural hegemony. I, I prefer prevention of domination by one power. Um, now this extends to how Southeast Asian states deal with each other. Think about the rivalries in the 60s, 50s and 60s between Indonesia and Malaysia for regional hegemony. Uh, but it also extends towards how Southeast Asia as a whole deals with great powers from inside and outside the region. So the idea here, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China since the 1990s, is that great strategic concern that an increasingly powerful China should not be able to dominate East Asia to the exclusion of other major players. Um, that last part's quite important. It's not about preventing China from becoming powerful. It's about preventing it from being able to dominate East Asia to the exclusion of other great powers. The second strategic imperative um, is shaped 
well, the imperative is one for diversification. Um, that clearly links to the first um, idea of prevention of domination by one power. And the principle of diversification is fundamentally influenced by uncertainty. Um, of course, the whole world is subject to uncertainty, but Southeast Asian states have a particular hold on this mantra of uncertainty. Um, in the post-Cold War period, it's been two uncertainties to do with great powers that has sort of occupied consistently the minds of Southeast Asian policymakers. One is obviously China's strategic intentions, obviously. And the second is the question of continued American interest and commitment to the region. Of the two, I would say that it's actually the second which tends to influence more greatly Southeast Asian strategic choices. They, at the end of the day, tend to be more concerned about whether America will remain interested and committed to the region. There is less uncertainty about China becoming powerful. Um, so that's a very quick sketch, and my screen has frozen. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, never mind. Um, of, of these sort of underpinning general um, principles we can think of. Now, what's happened over the last decade um, in Southeast Asia that we need to take note of? Now, I know that we're all obsessed with the South China Sea. I assure you that lots more has been going on in the region vis-a-vis -vis China and the United States than simply the South China Sea. Um, you know, it's very common, both in the scholarly and the analytical lit uh, policy analytical literature, to think about how Southeast Asia approaches the great powers in terms of hedging. The idea is very similar to economic hedging. Um, it's simply this idea that these states, again, are bound by the common sort of shared imperative of wanting both to have their cake and to eat it too. Right? So the idea of hedging being that you know, Southeast Asian states want to avoid having to choose, if possible, um, clearly to be on one side or the other, right? but to maintain good relationships with both the US and China in this case, if at all possible. Now, that's the ideal, naturally. Um, there's a large, tedious literature on hedging in the academic world, to which I have contributed quite a lot of hot air. But the basic principle, I think, is accurate. Um, and this is quite important to understand, um, particularly for those of us who may come from or who may work on sort of non-small states. You know, um, it's, not, it's not in the Southeast Asian DNA to want to stick, it, you know, any, to stick their necks out to say we're on your side, whether you're the US or China. Right? It's just not in the DNA. So to expect to go to Vietnam or Myanmar or Indonesia, which are all three cases, and say, so when are you going to do this, this, and this vis-a-vis -vis China, it's an unrealistic expectation. It's quite important to understand the hedging logic there. Now, as I said, it's a diverse region. So if we must you know, generalize somewhat, there are three groups of Southeast Asian states that we can think of. Right? It's a spectrum. It's obviously not a neat division. You think of a spectrum with the US on one side and China on the other. And they sort of line up in between. Think of three groups. The group that's closest to the US would obviously be the US Treaty Allies. So we've got two in the region. Thailand and the Philippines, right? Now, it's obviously much harder for US allies who are formally committed to hedge, right? Um, they obviously are not able to create the same kinds of security relationships with China as they've got with the United States, not formally anyway. So they're at this end of the spectrum mm -hmm. towards the United States. In the middle of the spectrum is where we would put what I call the real hedges, right? The ones that have no formal security relationships with either side, right? The ones who nevertheless support, have tended to support or facilitate US forward presence militarily, economically in the region in one way or another, right? Ship repair facilities, um, specially built um, ports for aircraft carriers, etc. In that group, we can put countries very clearly like Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, right? And then at the end of the spectrum closest to China, we've got what I would call the China-constrained states. Right? These are China-constrained for reasons of geography and for history reasons as well. So these states are the ones which are contiguous with China and the ones that are located on mainland Southeast Asia rather than maritime Southeast Asia. So we think of 
what we call the CLMV countries, the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, right? Other countries that we would usually put on that side of the spectrum, closer to China. Now, that's, that's the baseline with which we start. Now, over the last decade, a couple of interesting, notable things have happened to that spectrum. Right? Um, first thing to say, um, and all this is in the report, <coughs> is that the differences in policies and inclinations between this side of the spectrum and this side of the spectrum um, have increased. Right? You see greater differences now in Southeast Asian po alignment policy, if you want to put it that way, between, say, the Philippines and Laos. Right? That difference is qualitatively and quantitatively more significant than it was a decade ago. Right? And that's largely because the Philippines particularly has leveraged much more significantly on its alliance with the United States, particularly over the last five years, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, particularly over the South China Sea disputes. But the, ally the, the category of US allies in the region remains small too and remains, um, I would say, for the medium term, um, uncertain. Thailand has been in a state of limbo for the last five years because of its current <coughs> leadership. Um, and as you all know, the Philippines has just had an election. It's a new government. We will see what happens. It's probably not going to be the same sort of policy as the one that's just gone out. So we'll wait and see on that. The other really interesting change that has happened in, within the category of hedging states, which I talked about before, is that while these states have continued to maintain their very strong economic relations with China and have maintained their military to military exchanges and other sorts of security partnerships, of which China has a great many, um, with China, they've also, over the last 10 years, significantly increased the quantity and the quality um, of their, what we might call, balancing strategies, right, vis-a-vis -vis China. And for a lot of these states, obviously, it's, again, because of the maritime um, the territorial disputes or in a preemptive fashion, um, you know, a preparing for what they think might be disputes to come, right? So we see this with Indonesia and Malaysia, particularly, in quite a marked fashion. These are two countries which have tended until about three years ago to be very, very reluctant publicly to take any stance about their territorial disputes with China. Right. Um, over the last three years, we have seen much more public discussion of this, much more public displays of unhappiness. Again, those of you who read the papers will know this. Um, there are some detail in the report. There is, there's also been on the part of Indonesia and Malaysia particularly a tendency to resort to multilateral means as well of expressing these kinds of unhappiness with China's stance on these territorial disputes. Now, the most significant change over the last 10 years has come in the last category of the China constrained states, right? And that's what's really shifted where the median point is on the spectrum overall. And the changes come particularly on Vietnam and Myanmar's part. Right. Um, as Bates mentioned, we, we do have two specific country studies from an earlier phase of the project to do with these two countries as well as Indonesia. You will find these reports on the United States Studies Center, University of Sydney website. Um, they're there in soft copy. Now, the important thing about Vietnam and Myanmar is that over the last 10 years, and Myanmar more recently, of course, they've gradually begun to exercise options that they didn't have before. I remember writing a report for the East West Center, Washington, in 2005, where I basically said, you know, Vietnam is in that China constrained category because Vietnamese rulers remained vastly suspicious about the United States. Right? That means that their strategic options vis-a-vis -vis the United States will remain constrained. Um, that situation's obviously changed quite a lot since 2005. We're all aware of that. Um, and Myanmar too, right, um, has by reversing in the previous gov under the previous government from 2011, its certain of its policies managed to activate the U.S. strategic option vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, because of the changes in these two countries, the median point, as I said, of hedging 
um, has moved more towards the middle in Southeast Asia. There are now a majority of states in Southeast Asia who we can say have active possible hedging options to you know, balance the risks vis-a-vis -vis the US and China. Now that makes it much more important um, that the outside world needs to understand what that hedging means. Um, and I conclude this section of the report by warning that hedging really is a long-term policy. It may look in the short term like certain countries are picking one side at the expense of the other, um, but that's a necessary short-term adjustment. At the end of the day, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar do not have the luxury of not choosing China. That doesn't mean they're going to choose China only, but they do not have the luxury of alienating the Chinese for a variety of reasons. Myanmar needs Chinese cooperation to resolve its border ethnic issues. Can't do it without the Chinese. Right? Um, Indonesia and the other Southeast Asian countries, as I say in the report, are so economically interdependent with China. Right? And that measure of economic interdependence is, is, is more a constant than a variable. Right, for the region. Um, and that severely limits right, how much, again, these countries would be willing to stick their necks out to antagonize the Chinese on any issue, including territorial conflicts. Um, so one should expect, in the medium term and into the long term, a great deal of constraint um, on how much these Southeast Asian countries um, would be willing, A, to align with the United States, and B, for this to happen at the expense of their broader relationships with China. Right. Um, as a number of Southeast Asia, old ASEAN leaders are wont to say these days, you know, the relationship that Southeast Asia has with China is much broader than simply the South China Sea. There's a lot more at stake here. Um, and the other thing to be concerned about with, with which I will end is that fundamentally these countries um, most of the Southeast Asian countries have proven histories, right, vis-a-vis -vis the US and China, but we can say for sure that their bottom line is national interest and the pursuit of autonomy, if possible. Right? And that pursuit of autonomy is what sustains that strategy of hedging. Right? Hedging doesn't exist just so that they can boost, say, American presence in the region for the sake of it, right? Um, hedging exists because these states think that by doing, by leaning one side or another at certain points in time, they can maximize their own room for maneuver and their own auto chances for autonomous strategic decision making in spite of the uncertainties in the regional and international system. Um, and I think that particularly pertains in the case of Vietnam, which has been a very successful pra practic well, practic practic practitioner of that um, sort of policy. Now I've talked for too long, so I will stop and let Chin um, have a go. Thank you. Um, thanks very much to one and all for taking time out of your busy schedules to come listen to us on a Monday evening. And I want to echo uh, my colleagues. Thanks to Jan and the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations for hosting us and putting together this event uh, uh, for all of us here. Um, I wanted to uh, focus on the next part of the report, uh, which is looking at uh, China and Chinese uh, foreign policy outlook into the region and its views uh, on the United States uh, emerging security partnership with these three key Southeast Asian countries that uh, was part of the first part of our report. Um, the uh, one main uh, theme or takeaway, I think, from uh, this chapter of the report on China is uh, pretty straightforward and simple, um, and I think it um, uh, tends uh, not to align with some of the more alarmist views that we may hear uh, in media reports or in op-eds. And, and I think that one key takeaway or message, uh, if you will, is that while China has made major gains and inroads, both on the diplomatic, economic, and security fronts uh, in Southeast Asia, I think what we're seeing from this analysis is that there are still a number of hurdles uh, for China in translating its newfound uh, political military might and economic influence 
into uh, translating that into uh, attaining regional uh, influence and global influence, particularly its quest for uh, greater status, authority, and legitimacy from its neighbors. That is sort of the main takeaway and message. Um, and I thought I'd explain that and unpack that main theme a little bit more uh, in two parts. And one is to first explain uh, a little bit about China's strategic vision. What is it that undergirds Chinese foreign policy uh, toward Southeast Asia? Um, and then after that, unpack a little bit about uh, looking at uh, how is this applied uh, in Chinese foreign policy actions in practice uh, recently. So what is China's strategic vision? Um, it's always difficult to engage in this kind of reading the tea leaves activity, but I think if we look at the broader picture, a Chinese strategic vision uh, stems from a balanced mix of continuity and change in the Chinese leadership's foreign policy priorities and goals. And I think it boils down to this essential point, either uh, from Deng to Xi, it's this point that China needs a stable, peaceful, external security environment. And what is that for? That is to sustain and continue its path of domestic economic reform, development, and growth. That, for any Chinese leadership, remains the fundamental priority and, and uh, uh, legitimacy uh, in order to, to secure its legitimacy at home. Um, so that kind of rationale, I think, uh, if we understand where the Chinese leadership is coming from, the domestic agenda being so important, uh, we do see that uh, materialize in uh, more recently in Xi Jinping's uh, uh, message, which is coining and etching his, his uh, idea of the Chinese dream. And I know that sounds a little bit sort of aloof, and you know, what is this whole Chinese dream notion, this whole rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation? But I think if you uh, sift through some of the articles and internally circulated documents that have surfaced uh, about this idea, I think it really drives home the point about, again, uh, continued domestic economic reform and growth. Uh, it's about consolidating these dom dom domestic agenda. It's about strengthening China at home, uh, improving uh, income uh, disparity, bridging that gap, uh, addressing a lot of social, political, and economic issues on the domestic front, and to place China on a more competitive playing field vis-a-vis -vis the United States. In order for it to do that, it needs a stronger domestic base from which to build and expand and augment its uh, national comprehensive power. So I think the domestic socioeconomic agenda uh, dictates, in a way, uh, this emphasis on maintaining a stable, external, peaceful environment hints at China's reluctance to add to its long list of domestic challenges at home by risking highly provocative actions abroad, especially with the United States. That, I think, is one of the main elements that is highlighted in this report about China's strategic vision. So where is this applied in practice, and what are some of those challenges and issues that have surfaced as Chinese leadership tries to implement this uh, strategic vision in Southeast Asia? Um, as I mentioned earlier in the main theme, there are a number of hurdles, and the Chinese leadership is still struggling how to balance its multiple interests as it ventures abroad its borders into Southeast Asian affairs. Um, one key hurdle that we're seeing, as Evelyn has mentioned quite a bit, is on the South China Sea issue. And here, China has sought to demonstrate its resolve um, in uh, protecting its territorial sovereignty. And the rationale for such activism in the South China Sea, I think, seems to contradict the, the major theme that I laid out, uh, namely to maintain a stable external environment. Um, but I think the South China Sea is quite unique and special and it's one element, as Evelyn mentioned, in the broader picture of South China Sea, of China-Southeast Asia relations. But the South China Sea touches on a particularly sensitive issue for the Chinese leadership, and that's territorial sovereignty and integrity. And so when it comes to these kinds of issues, China tends to be more uh, assertive in maintaining its claims and less uh, uh, flexible in its ability to uh, bend over backwards in accommodating some of its neighbors' 
uh, desire for a peaceful, stable relationship. Um, but the broader picture of the South China Sea, the way I see it is that uh, in spite of all the tensions that have been ratcheting up over the last two, three years, what's interesting to me is that the conflict remains of low intensity. Um, China certainly has the military capabilities vis-a-vis -vis all the other claimant states to do what it wants if it chooses to. And I think the reason why it hasn't done so, again, is this constant reminder that a peaceful, stable external security is paramount for China's domestic growth. And so stirring up the South China Sea unnecessarily by using military force and capabilities is really not the go-to answer. And so to the extent possible, dispatch uh, militia, uh, fishermen from militia, dispatch the Coast Guard, which is a civilian agency, to deal with these kinds of issues. And where it has used its military assets, it tends to be uh, for defensive purposes, or so they claim. Um, so that's sort of something important to note. That must be a really important point and very illuminating. <laughs> oh, well. And not so interesting at all. <laughs> Um, the second aspect of China-Southeast Asia relations, I think, is the issue of uh, uh, China trying to deepen its economic engagement with the region. And there, I think China has been a lot more successful in the PR message. We've heard about the Asia Invest uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, the One Belt, One Road initiative, the Maritime Silk Road initiative, the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, RCEP, which is an alternative to uh, the U.S.-led uh, TPP trade agreement, um, and a whole range of other uh, economic largesse uh, to Southeast Asian neighbors. Um, the report flags that while there are these major inroads that China has made on the economic front, there are also a lot of uh, setbacks for the Chinese. Uh, if you follow closely uh, the degree to which Chinese foreign direct investment to the region actually pans out, uh, they usually don't. Uh, it pales in comparison to what Japan South Korea, the United States, and other major donors uh, have done in the region. And so I think on the economic front, uh, while there's a lot of hot air or a lot of media highlight and tension on those major uh, economic initiatives under this uh, Chinese leadership and previous ones, uh, if you dig a little bit deeper, you do see that there are a lot of challenges as well. Major problems with their large-scale infrastructure projects in Myanmar and other places where it's facing a lot of civil society pushback from the region as well as environmental concerns and labor safety and other uh, uh, issues dealing with um, uh, following through with these major uh, plans. Um, the last aspect of it that I want to touch on is that uh, in the China-Southeast Asia relationship, uh, a key concern for China is trying to test and delimit uh, U.S. influence in Asia. And here I think is where China is doing it incrementally, doing it slowly, again reminding themselves that this, they cannot afford a destructive, a, a, a relationship that is uh, centered around rivalry. Um, and so they're cautious in the way that they are engaging Southeast Asian neighbors and trying to test out their strategies in pushing the limits and seeing how far the United States would go to defend its allies like the Philippines and uh, as well as with new emerging security partnerships like Vietnam, Indonesia, Myanmar, and others. Um, so here I think the Chinese are testing the waters. Um, I think they are feeling confident that with their newfound economic and political might that they're able to gradually wean these neighboring countries away from the United States and into its sphere of influence. Uh, whether that will be successful or not, I think as Dr. Goh mentioned, uh, the Southeast Asian countries are smart and savvy and so they are trying to have constructive relations with both, and they don't want to be pit uh, 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 in this uh, tug of war between China and the United States, having to be forced to be two sides uh, by the Chinese. So I think there, again, in delimiting Chinese influence, uh, the Chinese desire and aspirations will face a lot of regional uh, tests and challenges. Um, so, in a nutshell, I'll end there and turn over to Bates on the United States uh, implications for the U.S. All right. Thanks very much, Jin, and thanks also to Evelyn for your comments. I'll try and be very, very brief because I know we had a lot of questions and discussion to have on some of these points. You'll see in the report that we try to make the very strong case that uh, vigorous and effective American engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and increasingly in Southeast Asia 
must endure as a strategic imperative for the United States. And this is true long after President Obama and all the talk of the pivot uh, is well behind us. There's an opportunity here, huge opportunity for the United States. Uh, we have heard that there is high expectation in the Indo-Pacific and in Southeast Asia in particular of a continued U.S. focus on economic, diplomatic, and security related engagement and devotion of resources to the region. And as she explained in describing the movement along the spectrum, there is growing gravitation uh, at present toward the United States. So this uh, offers up an opportunity. And we go into great detail in the report in the U.S. section that I authored, uh, laying out, uh, I think, the case for success, not just during the Obama administration, but even predating that during the George uh, W. Bush administration, of beginning to focus resources in a more and more effective way uh, to improve America's presence and engagement uh, in a part of the world which for far too long uh, was a bit of a foreign policy backwater for the United States, namely Southeast Asia. So I think we can see good opportunities ahead, but a lot of big questions, I think, attend uh, uh, whether the United States can do so. Uh, and we lay out in some detail what those challenges are. Um, one I'd just like to flag in particular, though, for our discussion perhaps this evening, um, is uh, arising from within the United States itself. Uh, and and not, not even mentioning all the various challenges that are faced with regard to dealing with some of the individual countries as well as, of course, uh, finding the right mixture of, of engagement and, um, uh, and, and deterrence, which is going to uh, define uh, the future relationship with China. In particular at home, uh, we note that there seem to be signs among the leading contenders for the U.S. presidency that strategic engagement in Asia may not be a high priority. Um, if that's true, in our view, uh, this would be a major, major mistake for the United States. So with those challenges uh, and, and the others we describe in the report in mind, we try to lay out at the end of the report a kind of agenda, uh, uh, some recommendations and, and uh, ideas uh, for the incoming uh, new administration in Congress, which will take office in early 2017. First, signaling sustained strategic commitment. Um, we cannot let the successes of the past five to 10 years in Southeast Asia flag. Uh, the next president should make early and highly visible statement, visible statement to demonstrate continuing U.S. commitment in the region, should commit to delivering a new Indo-Pacific strategic review in 2017. Um, obviously, the U.S. Secretary of State and U.S. Secretary of Defense ought to make their first overseas trip to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, upon entering office, and of course the next president should firmly commit to participate in the suite of annual East Asia uh, related summitry that goes on uh, in the region, even though that often entails uh, at least two major trips to the region per year. And obviously on his, his or her first trip to the region, uh, stops ought to be made at a minimum with allied partners Japan and South Korea. So sustained strategic commitment needs to be signaled from the very beginning of of our next um, uh, leadership. Deepening economic engagement. Um, I, I know you are all familiar with the issues at play here, here at home. Um, we recommend that the U.S. Congress should expeditiously move to approve the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, an agreement which is far more than just a trade deal, uh, which again signals uh, the strategic commitment the United States intends to have in this region for decades to come. We have other economic ideas, but we'll get into those later if you'd like. Bolstering diplomatic presence and engagement. Um, in the near term, the U.S. government should sustain a comprehensive diplomatic plan that's going to support the forthcoming decision from the Permanent Court of Arbitration regarding the Philippines case against China under the U.N. Convention of the Law of the Sea. And I understand that this is already ongoing, but this diplomatic strategy, which will probably be launched in uh, seriousness, in mid-2016 when the decision is made uh, should also be taken up and sustained by uh, our next government in the White House. We ought to support the ongoing diversification diplomacy which ASEAN states have undertaken, uh, that they seek a broader and stronger array of bilateral and multilateral economic, political, and security relationships beyond the United States. That is certainly in the United States' interest to see that happen. 
In particular, the new U.S.-Indonesia strategic partnership, which was announced in October of last year, uh, ought to be strengthened and try to establish a more regularized, substantive, and impactful economic and diplomatic security, technical, and people-to-people -people relationships with this extremely important emerging country, which is uh, Indonesia. And to the greatest extent possible, we recommend that we do a lot more in strengthening our relations with Myanmar and that the next president and Congress should work more cooperatively to lift the remaining constraints uh, and sanctions which uh, impede a more successful political and economic relationship with that emerging country in Southeast Asia. And finally, we make a number of recommendations for increasing effective security partnerships in the region to increase multilateral military to military opportunities for consultation, training, joint exercises, and interoperability, not only amongst, our, uh, amongst American allies, such as Australia, Japan, and the Philippines, but also with other emerging security partners in the region, such as Ind India, Indonesia, and of course, Singapore. But this has to be done consistent with the security aims and interests of the individual ASEAN states, and to the greatest extent possible be done in a way which avoids a singular focus on China, uh, but rather assures a more broad-based security relationship that encompasses capacity building on other important security challenges in the region, like counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, uh, search and rescue, disaster relief, and uh, civil military relations. I recognize that we've gone on too long, and uh, I want, I'll stop, stop short there, uh, but we're happy to talk more about how we can do more across the policy spectrum to uh, um, improve our strategic engagement in Southeast Asia, which we feel very strongly uh, is surely in the interest of the United States uh, and also in the interest of regional stability and, if done properly, uh, is a way to also help assure improved relations with China. Thank you all. That was an extremely rich palette of information that you've given us. Um, Thanks so much. Uh, great to see uh, Bates and uh, Chanel again. Nice to meet Evelyn as well. Um, uh, Carl Minster Fordham Law School. I work on China's domestic law and politics. I was curious about you raised Vietnam, and in your in your report here, in sort of one of your discussions with respect to Vietnam, the U.S. government should steadily and consistently continue to open the defense and military to military relationship. I was kind of curious to hear a little bit more about what you think that means, and I was just going to give a hypothetical. Three months after the inauguration of the new president. Uh, Chinese drilling activity in the South China Sea leads to, you know, Vietnamese deploying vessels, low intensity conflict develops between China and Vietnam. What should the United States do? What's the correct policy uh, with respect to potential military uh, conflict between the two over the South China Sea? Um, just briefly, um, in my view, clearly uh, not getting involved uh, directly in a military confrontation or conflict between China and Vietnam uh, would strike me as a wise policy. Um, the, the state of U.S. Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam uh, military to military and other defense related relations is at a quite low level. Uh, and for the reasons which uh, Evelyn has already explained, uh, are unlikely to move uh, very fast uh, or very far very soon. So this is a long game uh, kind of uh, relationship and relationship building would have to be undertaken. Um, and in the near term, um, it certainly doesn't mean, <laughs> and, 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 and certainly couldn't mean, uh, the establishment of any sort of uh, alliance relationship or other types of security guarantee uh, for Vietnam from the United States. Rather, it would probably mean more in the way of simply helping Vietnam improve its capacity uh, to know what's going on uh, in its own maritime domain. Um, so even though the arms embargo uh, has been fully lifted uh, in principle, uh, and that uh, in principle any and all uh, kinds of uh, military equipment could be transferred to 
Vietnam, that is a far-fetched possibility. Uh, not only because of Vietnam's own domestic constraints and concerns about how far and how fast they would want to uh, have those sorts of linkages with the United States. Um, there are also just the very pragmatic complications of why would they want of Ameri a lot of American kit uh, when they're already so heavily invested in so much in the way of Russian um, equipment. And it wouldn't fly in America. Uh, let's not forget um, that in spite of all the concerns you might hear about uh, you know, China and its uh, uh, role in the South China Sea, there are still very powerful voices in our country which don't want to see the U.S.-Vietnam relationship moving very far and very fast, uh, who are very concerned about the legacies of the Vietnam War, very concerned about the continued leadership of the Vietnamese Communist Party, uh, and all the problems that arise out of that in terms of political and human and civil and other rights in, in Vietnam. Um, so just to speak directly to your scenario, uh, I don't think there's a whole lot the United States can do Mil there should, should be anything particularly militarily that they can do, um, but uh, it would, would probably be more from the sidelines in terms of political and diplomatic uh, condemnation. Can I just add two small points to that, because I think this is important. Um, I, uh, I may be overstating it to make the point, but number one, I would trust the Vietnamese to work this out. They have a very long and successful experience of how to deal with the Chinese. Um, and secondly, if you had to back a horse in Southeast Asia against the Chinese, I would bet on Vietnam. Um, because they know what they're doing, we hope. <laughs> um, but also because of precisely the things that Bates has been talking about. It would be indirect, often through third parties. You would work with the Indians um, to help the Vietnamese boost capability in the medium term, because the Indians have access to the types of systems that the Vietnamese would most effectively want um, at this point. Um, and it would be deniable in that sense. So politically, it's probably more doable for the, con for the reasons that Bates has posed as constraints. I think they're also facilitating factors that would allow quite a lot to be achieved in an indirect way by the United States. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Tim Brooks, as one of the exchanges years ago, and have been in uh, Vietnam just recently, actually, on a cultural uh, tour. Uh, and I, I'm very partially addressed this, but I, I'm very interested in whether the how the Chinese view both the military uh, cooperation, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. that has recently emerged between the United States and Vietnam, uh, and also the TPP, uh, which of course excludes the Chinese. <laughs> Uh, is this seen as a provocation to them? Uh, is it seen as something that they they think they can handle? Uh, are those both, you, you seem to indicate those are both things that we should pursue, we should continue. Uh, how is that going to play uh, among the Chinese leadership, do you think? Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I think on the the TPP front, um, it's, it's a major concern for the Chinese leadership, and they've put their efforts in strengthening the RCEP, the alternative to the TPP. Uh, both actually have the eventual goal of, of establishing a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific, uh, broadly under the APEC framework. Um, so I think they're not, um, uh, I was reading uh, something earlier today uh, from the Chinese analysis on this, saying that uh, they think the RCEP uh, is not necessarily against TPP, uh, that they are complementary efforts to institutionalize uh, regional trade frameworks and lowering tariffs, and, and that RCEP, this Chinese-led framework, is more suitable uh, for the type of economies that are in under this umbrella that the Chinese are, are pioneering, whereas the TPP is a more advanced and a higher standard. Um, so. I think it's, it's easy to interpret that as sort of um, that they're going against each other. But I think if you look at the broader picture of what both of these trade deals do for the region, I think at the end of the day, it's probably a positive uh, thing and that they're pursued simultaneously. Um, there is the, of course, the image that they're being competitive and going against one another uh, by virtue of the uh, membership 
uh, status where China is not in TPP and the United States is not involved in RCEP. Um, but I think if you if you dig further, I think the the, the broader picture is more complementary than than um, uh, butting heads against one another. All the way in the back. Hello, Miles Matthews. Are you saying that you believe the TPP will be approved during the um, lame duck session of Congress without South Korea and China joining in the TPP? Because I hear a few people making it sound like China cannot join the TPP. China can join the TPP while it's going through legislative approval or afterwards. So it's not like they're excluded. I, I agree with you there, and in the deepening economic engagement section of, the, of, of our recommendations, we, I stressed that we would like to move expeditiously forward uh, to have Congress make its final up or down vote and have the President sign it into law as soon as possible. I suppose that is a, a hint or an expectation that it could be done during the lame duck session. The, the very next bullet point is once the TPP is enforced, the United States should welcome membership by other countries in the region which meet the agreement's criteria with special effort being made to bring China, Indonesia, the Philippines, and South Korea on board. So I'm entirely agreeing with you. There's nothing in the TPP that excludes China, nothing at all. Uh, as soon as China's ready to join and can meet its criteria, I think, uh, well, I think it'd be foolish for the United States to keep them out. I don't know what the next president will think. Uh, I was at a conference this morning at breakfast on the TTP. It was Michael Froman, who's head of uh, a US trade representative. and. They feel there is a very small window of opportunity to have TTP passed, and they are trying their best to go for it, whether it will work or not, but that is the administration's plan. Mm -hmm. And during the lame duck session. Mm -hmm. oh. Hello, um, I'm Missy Brover uh, with the Schiller Institute. Um, now, there is currently two paradigms in the world right now, one which is represented by China and the new Silk Road, where building of high-speed rail, nuclear power plants, and space programs are being used as a means for creating peace through development internationally. Now, the transatlantic system is currently hopelessly bankrupt with Wall Street and City of London's $2 quadrillion debt bubble, so the question is, what is our response? Instead of going along with what we have been seeing uh, um, here lately with NATO's maneuvers close to the Russian border, the biggest since World War II. We and US sorry, we're getting close to time, so let's yes, answer yes. your question. And the U.S. provocations in South China Sea, which could be a, a trigger for World War III, uh, something which there's been warnings about lately by European uh, leaders. Why don't we, what do you think about the idea of U.S leaving uh, geopolitics behind and creating peace through development by joining in on the new Silk Road. That's my question. Do you want to collect a few if we're short uh, of time? Yeah, let's, because we are very short of time, can I have two more questions maybe? Um, Mara, the three people in the line coming up, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, um, real quick question. Do you ever think, the panel, do you guys think that when and if we can settle the disputes I mean, just kind of like make a deal. When, how long would it take for this to kind of, uh, you know, get all settled, settled between? You mean TTP? No, I'm, no. I'm talking about between China and the rest of the Southeast Asian countries. Okay. Like okay. Just... And then Marty and men in front of him, and one of that would take four questions because okay. this panel is really smart and they'll be able to do it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but real <laughs> short, Marty. Yeah. Real short. I hate to do this, but I can't avoid it. How do you make the case for the Pacific region being more important than the Middle East to a new country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in other words, the first trips yeah. of the new administration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Keith Rabin, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, in Myanmar and other countries working on this, so uh, on economic development and electrification. So one question is that much of the comments are on how to manage this relationship and the competition or hedge, but what are the prospects for you know, closer economic cooperation, particularly as China needs to, uh, it shifts more to higher value added and moving lower end manufacturing offshore. And U.S. companies are, you know, while wanting to engage in Asia, are not necessarily prepared to uh, fund large scale infrastructure and uh, 
organize their own manufacturing there. So it would seem that uh, you know there's a lot of U.S. purchasing that's done in China, which could easily ship to Southeast Asia if there was a cooperative mechanism, which would work to the benefit of both countries. Okay. Thank you. And final question. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about what are the what are the sort of classic tactics, uh, Evelyn, you talked about uh, in the in the hedging framework from those countries' perspective. What are the tactics that they're looking to implement? And then also, um, our friend in the middle, Chin. Chin. Um, what are the tactics that China is using over their long-term strategy? Uh, what are the specific chips that they're trying to play? Okay. I take it when we. We, we can each maybe say something, but that's probably going to be about it for the. Uh, yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so this is. The I'll leave that last. Question. I'll leave that last question to Chin and um, <laughs> Elin because it was asked them specifically. Um, just a, just a few quick comments. I hope I can respond to everyone's great questions. Um, in the report, uh, in, in response to the first question about why doesn't the U.S. just become more cooperative and um, and uh, let China run the sh run the show, um, we d we do make the uh, recommendation that um, uh, the World Bank. And the Asian Development Bank, both bodies, you know, which have been traditionally led by the United States or close uh, American allies like Japan, uh, need to do a lot more to find how to engage more effectively with these new Chinese initiatives, and in particular, the Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank. Um, and there are some inklings of that, and um, maybe we we certainly do need to see a great deal more. The one um, belt, one road. Um, I think we still have to wait and see just exactly what that's going to entail. Um, try to understand a little bit better uh, the success or failure of China's efforts to push this, this effort. Um, there may well be opportunities for U.S. participation or investment in that. I mean, looking over the long term, I don't see necessarily why One Belt, One Road should be seen as a threat to the United States. Um, uh, looking in a strategic perspective, if we're able to somehow bring greater development uh, and prosperity through these investments from China to difficult parts of the world, well, um, maybe that's not such a bad thing for the United States overall. So I, I probably wouldn't be as pessimistic or, uh, 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 I, I would be neither as pessimistic as you, as you seem to be about American engagement in the world, uh, nor would I be as optimistic that America is going to change its ways. Uh, believe, it, believe me, we'll remain engaged very much so in the world, and I think in positive ways, as has been the case in the past. Um, how to make the case, Marty? Turn to page 24 of this report. Um, it's the, first, the first three columns are devoted to making the argument for why uh, Indo-Pacific broadly, and Southeast Asia in particular, need to remain front and center in American thinking going forward across economic, diplomatic, security-related, and sort of normative, you know, normative reasons uh, about emerging democracies and the so forth and so forth in the region. So that's that's where you'll find your your case. Um, I'll let you guys answer when when China is gonna you know get everything settled with Southeast Asia. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yes yes let me take the one that was directed to me specifically first. Um, tactics of hedging are, are manifold, obviously. Um, they encompass economic security as well as uh, political tools. Uh, political tools are paramount in, in many ways, as you would expect with, with weaker states. A um, couple of things to, 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 to mention that are worth noting. Um, one of the very clear tactics of hedging is to try to ensure that the economic track is separated from the security track and insulated from it as much as possible. This is why you see all the Southeast Asian countries assiduously cultivating China economically at the same time as they're having territorial conflicts. It's that desire to keep them separate as far as possible. Now, I don't know how long they're going to be separable for, but they, they've succeeded fairly well so far. But the other one is to facilitate, but to confine US commitment to the region. I call this the intelligent harnessing of US power. So it's not to facilitate US projection in the region you know, with boundless opportunities. It's not that. Because you know, in, an, in answer uh, also to that question about how do you make Southeast Asia more important than the Middle East, you don't. And Southeast Asia doesn't want to be more important than the Middle East because it's dangerous. Right? <laughs> you don't want the US to be overly committed to the region. You just want it to be committed intelligently enough 
not too much, because it's dangerous. Right? So that's my, and that's why maybe I slightly disagree with Bates' interpretation on page 24, was it? Yeah. Um, I don't think it needs to be the top priority. It needs to be on the radar screen enough, but not the top priority. Um, and on the, um, just very quickly, on the economic um, dimension, um, I, I agree with you about what you're saying, but it occurs to me that you know, US economic interests and Chinese economic interests and the, and the economic tools they choose to, to deploy in the region are actually quite complementary. Um, so it's not a head-to-head -head contest. I don't see it that way. I, I don't think that many Southeast Asian states see it that way, which is why they want to have their economic cake and eat it too on both sides. But I don't think you can actually coordinate on this partly because of the way US economic interests are channeled. It, it's just not state-run as the way a lot of it is in China still today. But maybe we can hope that market forces will ensure that this will remain complementary. Um, so I think there is some argument for the hidden hand, the invisible hand, if you like, still. Chin, last word. Last word. Um, on the tactics, I think uh, if we try to look at what China's been doing, I think it's fair to say, and safe to say, that what China is doing is trying to persuade and convince its neighbors uh, that there is more to gain uh, from working with Chinese interests than from uh, deterring and challenging them. Um, and I think the primary concern for the Chinese is that uh, there is a sort of growing sense of uh, uh, coalition that's containing or constraining China's growth. And um, so this new emerging security partnership that the U.S. is pushing forward in the region, the U.S. rebalancing efforts to, to, to Asia-Pacific region, uh, is seen by some Chinese as sort of uh, an active uh, coalition working against them. And so I think going forward, we're going to see the Chinese assiduously pushing back, testing the limits uh, of, of U.S. influence and trying to do what it does best, which is to put forward economic proposals and deals and try to um, touch on issues that matter most to Southeast Asia at large, which is a very, it's an emerging economy. There are a lot of emerging economies in the region. And so those bread and butter issues, economic issues, are the ones that they think are going to sell and fly well with their Southeast Asian neighbors. Um, on the uh, issue of uh, when China will settle a deal with its Southeast Asian neighbors on the South China Sea, um, there is a ruling that's going to come out from the international arbitration, the courts on the South China Sea, uh, which the Philippines lodged against the Chinese. Um, you will most likely hear the Chinese deflect that. Uh, what's more important, I, th I would put more emphasis on the regionally bred consensus that's going to emerge, uh, which is the focus on developing a code of conduct uh, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, I think the, the preference for the Chinese is to see something that's regionally developed and not something that's handed down to them from The Hague. Uh, I think something that has the consensus of both claimant states and non-claimant states alike uh, if ASEAN is able to get uh, its house in order, to get its preferences set straight, and to negotiate uh, with the Chinese as a ten-body unit versus the Chinese, collectively that kind of persuasion is going to go f farther than bilaterally. Um, and uh, ASEAN has proven to be effective in years past. Uh, the fact that the Chinese have signed a treaty of amity and cooperation before the United States has, I think, uh, speaks to the strength and to the merits of this regional institution, and that the Chinese do take it seriously when the regional institution speaks with one voice. So I think that's the one that we're going to see where China may be able to settle some of the differences and focus on commonalities and functional cooperation in the South China Sea going forward. On that very hopeful note, uh, please join me in welcoming and um, thanking Yvonne and Chen and Bates for a really wonderful talk. Thank you very much.